meeting once where there was a guy sitting right next to a speaker and this guy was bellowing from the front saying, can everybody hear me here? And he just came bananas. And this guy near to speak, he said, I can hear you, but I don't mind change with somebody who can't hear. <laughs> Let's pray, shall we? Thank you, Father, that when our voice stops, there's a greater voice, the voice of the Holy Spirit, that will take what we think we've said and apply it to the hearts of men and women. We're so glad, Father, your word teaches us that you watch over your word to perform it. You watch over it. What's been said and sung here tonight, you're watching over it. So the finest and the most essential things are brought from it. In Jesus' name, bless your word to our hearts. And we would say, Lord, for what? We're about to receive. May the Lord make us truly thankful. Amen. The song that was sung, which is the part of Jeremiah chapter 8, which, when you read Jeremiah 8, it's basically the end part when false prophets have been prophesied. You read the surrounding chapters of 7, 8, 9, 10, 11. You'll find the verses like that we preach many times, for they have healed the hurt of the door to my people slightly and lightly saying peace, peace, when there is no peace. Verses like that we look for peace and no good came. And for a time of hell, but there was trouble. For the hurt of my people, says Jeremiah, amongst all the false prophets prophesying. For the hurt of my daughter, I'm hurt. I'm mourning, astonished, taken hold of me. Is there no balm in Gilead? Is there no physician there? Why then is there no recovery for the health of the daughter of my people? And I find there's a lot of words given, a lot of things said, but very little action that I see. And I hear people rave about the Reformation and everything else come from the Reformation. When you look through today, there's not a lot. We heard in this borough around 250,000, 215,000 people live here. All the Christians know would not make 2,000. We're not doing a good job. We've got to face that. We're not doing a good job. And we need to see God to do something amiss. I was saying this morning that when you read <clears throat> Ezekiel 47, that many are quoting now about the river. The river of God in Ezekiel 47, it comes under the threshold. It comes under our structure. They can have board meetings, they can have deacons meet and elders meet. When the Holy Spirit moves, it goes under it. And it's a river. But it says further down that it comes past the south altar. And we know that whatever we have in this world, and I believe there are people here tonight who have been the healers. You need to understand, any healing that bypasses Jesus and the cross is a deception. Anything that you get from this life, whether health or wealth, whatever it is. Because I know the river came and went under the threshold, under the structure, under the structure of the temple, it flowed out under it. But it didn't bypass the altar and the altar is a cross. And I believe that there needs to be a rediscovery of the cross of Jesus Christ. Because without it there is no salvation, there is no redemption. And without the cross we have no power over the enemy. It's through the blood of his cross. It says in Revelation 12 that they overcame him by the blood of the Lamb, by the word of their testimony, and they loved not their life even unto death. We are sharing this morning that God is looking for people, wanting to give people that kind of Caleb spirit that won't give up. That he says in Joshua 14, it says for, for 45 years he kept hold of his vision. He kept hold of God. He wouldn't let go. He kept pressing in. Can you imagine? 45 years in the wilderness, knowing that God had given the promised land. We've been in Israel and those who know that Israel at that time lived in a promised land. God was miraculously keeping them. That the pillar of cloud by day kept them cool and kept the bandits, desert bandits away. The pillar of fire by night, I believe, was sent the legion. He kept warm. 
And it was God's presence. God supplied them water for 40 years and food. That was a miracle. But they were walking in disobedience. A sign of signs and wonders and God answering your prayers is not a sign you're walking with God. Which it was. Many things that God does, He does it out of goodness of His heart. Because He loves you. If God he only answered your prayers when you did it right, I don't think we'd get much answered. Is that true? Do you know your life like I know mine? We like to put up these kind of things where we think can achieve. We need to understand that without the cross and without redemption there is none. And I believe tonight I want to share with you because we all come up against Goliaths in our lives. We always meet them. Those Goliaths, we're going to see in a moment, the shouts at us, that taunts us, saying you've done it again, you fell again, you've sinned again. Anybody been there? Well, you think, I'll never get over this. He taunts us. And I just want to read some scripture to you, but I want to say that so much of what is happening today, praise God for it. Thank God for the Toronto blessing, or whatever they call it. But we are stuck. I was saying this morning, we're always stuck. It's good to be here. When the voice of God said, it's not good to be here. You may get blessed. And even today, I find people saying, I mean, every night, the Toronto blessing, what for? I do not know. Because we need to move on. If all we do is bless God, shake and laugh, praise God for it, but you can't live on that. And you'll never fight the warfare that way either. Praise God for what God is doing. And we want to see more of that in our body here. We, we do that. We reach out to God to do things. But I believe God is looking for people who will get filled, who will get blessed and go out and reach his world. Because the best place for you and I at this moment is in glory, out of this world. Anybody believe that? Because we've been delivered from the penalty of sin. We are being delivered from the power of sin every day. And one day we'll be delivered from the presence of sin. If you're a preacher, you've got three sermons there. But we have. But one day God's going to deliver me, as Paul down here said tonight, my son-in-law, that, that why are we in this body? You know, one of the translations said, that this body, says, Paul, humiliates me. It's the body of humiliation. You ever look to yourself dancing? You ever done it in the spirit? You ever done it? Don't you look stupid? Just God's humiliation. Letting God know that it's not use him. But I believe if we're going to win this war, there are issues to meet the face. Because they're biblical. They're biblical principles. That's why we have in Romans 15 verse 2, that all things are written, written four times, happen for our learning. We don't have to do what David did. We don't have to do what Samson did. Because they missed it. Missed God's best. And I find in my own life that often God blesses me not because of what I am, but in spite of what I am. Because it shows me His grace. And I believe that the three wonders of heaven, the first wonder of heaven is the people you thought should be there, won't be there. The second one of heaven is the people you thought should be there, won't be there, and the others won't be there either. But the third thing is, <laughs> the third wonder of heaven is that you'll be there. It's a fact. You can look in heaven and think, I didn't think he'd make it. I didn't think he was a Christian. Because nobody ha knows what happens between the time of death and going to be. I believe at the point of death, I believe God gives everybody an opportunity to turn around. I believe that. I believe that. Because he's not willing any should perish. Hope my doctrine's straight on this. <laughs> but God's heart is much bigger. And so I just want to read two passages of scriptures to you and, and comment on the first one. 1 Samuel chapter 17. Keep your finger in that and then 1 Timothy chapter 1. 1 Samuel 17. Because we're in warfare today. We're at war. I just gave somebody, I don't know where to put it, but it's what was sent by Wellington to the home office that were asking him to go through all the camp and find out where one of nightmares was. True. A letter he wrote. While I'm dragging this army across the plains into Spain trying to drive out Napoleon, you want to know what, where the one of nightmares has gone. It's a fact. 
We're so small minded. You know, people are not aware that God wants us to think big and understand what he's doing. We have said if you want to walk on water, you've got to get out of the boat. That's a frightening bit. Yeah. You want to walk on water, you get a boat. It's part of faith and part of what God is doing. Verse 4 says in 1 Samuel 17, And the champion went out from the camp of the Philistines named Goliath. Height was six cubits a span. Nearly, under, nearly ten foot, I understand. And then, in verse 8, Then he stood and cried out to the armies of Israel and said to them, Why have you come out in line after battle? Am I not a Philistine? And are you servants of Saul? Choose a man for yourself and let him come down. If he's able to fight with me and kill me, then we will be your servants. But if I prevail and kill him, then he shall be my servants. And the Philistine said, I defy the armies of Israel this day. Give me a man that we may fight together. And then 1 Timothy 1, and verse 18 and 19. This charge I commit you, son Timothy, according to the prophecies previous made concerning you, that by them you wage a good warfare, having faith and a good conscience. One without the other will not do. Most people suffer defeat because of their conscience. The first message I heard preached on conscience, I had a preacher myself. I don't hear preachers talk about a conscience. The conscience problem will give you more problems than your demon will. Because you can't ask the blood to cleanse it, you can't ask God to take it away because your conscience has been damaged. The issues we need to put right. And in faith and a good conscience, which some have been rejected concerning the faith, have suffered shipwreck. A bad conscience will scuff your faith and will sink you. If you've done something you know is wrong and you're not prepared to face it, I'm discovering and have discovered you won't find faith. Faith will be absent when there's a bad conscience. The same is if you've got fear, you can't have faith. And if you've got faith, you can't have fear. They're directly opposed. One, one, twelve, and the other, that light will not be where darkness is. And so God's heart, I believe, is in one wage, a good warfare. In 1936, during the Spanish Civil War, that the, that when the general looked over the particular city, he was going to destroy his men with him officers said, how will we destroy this? Will the northern army, will they be, be in first and bring the victory? Will the southern or the west and the eastern? And the general in that 1936 Spanish Civil War said this. He said that this warfare will not be won by the soldiers without. I put men inside that city. It will fall from inside. Let me tell you, it's not the demons that defeat you. It's what's already there inside you. A bad attitude will wipe you out. Anybody found that? You go and pray with a bad attitude? Anybody tried it? Rebuke the devil as much as you like. You're not dealing with the devil. It's the enemy within. But I believe we have the enemy that shouts and taunts as Goliath taunted. How we got to him. How we got to Israel until Paul, our Saul, was a man, head and shoulders above everybody else. Yet he couldn't handle it. So let me say this. The reason why Saul couldn't handle Goliath, one, because he was a people's choice, not God's choice. If you take up leadership in any church and you're their choice instead of God, you're going to have a problem. That's the reason why Saul couldn't stand against Goliath, because it was a people's choice. Let me tell you, we have this in history, Bible history, that if you push God and keep pushing Him, He'll give you what you want, and when you get it, you're in trouble. I've seen that in many people's lives. I've seen people want to marry someone who's not of God, and I tell them, push it and push it, and when they get it, they've got a disaster of a life, and God doesn't let them out. <laughs> people's choice. But in Saul, there was a lack of preparation. It came in by the prophetic word, of Samuel, as good as that is, there was no sense of preparation. Paul talked about that. We need to see it. Lack of servanthood. God has always prepared people. Moses, 40 years in the wilderness, looking after sheep, looking after people, and God got a sense of humour. Because people and sheep are the same. 
Elijah, John the Baptist. We understand that Elisha poured water over Elijah's hands for 10 years. Boring, isn't it? That's what he did for 10 years. Listen, if you can't serve, God won't let nobody serve you. If you can't be taught, he won't let you teach. If you can't be led, he won't let you lead. And this was Saul's problem. He couldn't face it. He couldn't handle it. He couldn't understand why God wasn't dealing with his heart until David come on the scene. You see, I believe we are at war. Uh, Roger already said it tonight, you know. We know that the cross is a finished work. But God has given the ministry of administration to the church to administrate the work of the cross. It's our job. God has put it in our hands. I said earlier on that in, in Ephesians 3.10 that God's manifold wisdom is going to be shown in these last days not through some big ministry but through the church. Through the church. God's heart is a church. And we know as a body in England way that our desire is to see function right across. I've discovered this, that God wants to bind and build us together. Round it, the Elam way at the moment, they'll be building houses. There's a stack of bricks standing out there. If you want to steal any, you can go around and steal it. But let me tell you, when that bricklayer picks them up and cuts them, puts cement on them, and puts it in beside other bricks, and it dries, you've got to attack the whole street to get one out. <laughs> And if you do not belong to a church and don't have roots in it, the enemy will pick you off all the time because you're not in anything. Once bricks have been put in this building and put together, if you can take a brick out of this building, you've got to attack the whole building. That's why God has put us in the body. He put us in the church. Many people come for healing and come for help and don't belong anywhere. They can't even take the time and discipline their life to go to the house of God. I wonder why the devil, what the devil's after. We've got this thing about the devil. I was, I was in a meeting in Peterborough about 15 years ago and a, a dear lady, I think she meant well, every night, as soon as we finished, she'd come up to me and said, the devil's been after me again, bro. And after three nights, I had enough. <laughs> I said, look here, let me tell you something. The devil's not everywhere, he's an omnipresent starter. And secondly, what have you got that's so special to want the devil after you every day? What have you got? You must be some big. Got this kind of understanding. Others, of course, if you leave the devil alone, he'll leave you alone. He didn't leave Adam and Eve alone, and now no sin. So he'll not leave you alone. Do you think I'm disturbing the children at night? <laughs> it's all right. But Adam and Eve had no sin. People say to me, well, if you had my job, if you had my home, my street, you couldn't live clean. Adam and Eve had no sin. And they got as a counsel every night, but they didn't live straight. Because the problem always is what's in here. It's in here's the issue. I believe if you leave the devil alone, he won't leave you alone. He never left Jesus alone. So he's going to be after you. They say the devil cannot hurt anybody because I'm in Christ. A war is never one-sided. Paul says that this is a wrestling match. The closest form of combat is who is going to submit to who. It's a wrestling match. And we face that every day. We're told not to ignore the devil, we're told to resist him. It's not ignoring him. Resist him. I believe we need to understand that the devil was finished through the cross and he has no power. But nothing is automatic. If it was, we'd have a perfect church. And we know we haven't got that. Everybody knows that. We need, I believe, to cooperate with God. God's heart is for that. And I believe, as the scripture says in Revelation 12, that our accuser, accuses us day and night. As Goliath came out and accused him, let me tell you something. That's why I've read that scripture from 1 Timothy 1.18. As the devil got something in your life to accuse you of, Jesus said, the prince of this world comes and got, can't find anything in me. You say that's Jesus. If Jesus could be tempted and fall, what chance we got if he wasn't? 
It says that they, they were being. It says that they accused them before God. Day and night. The enemy is an accuser. I believe we need to understand how we can handle this accusation. Will you turn to 1 Samuel with me again? Just 1 Samuel 15, is it not? Is that right? 1 Samuel 17, somebody's got more of a handle. just want to go through and just make some statements. So I believe it's here in the Word. Read 1 Samuel 17, we get home and get hold of it. Because there's biblical principles here of how we can handle the enemy. See, everybody say to me, you've got to fight the devil. How? Got resistance. How? The church has always come down wrong on the how-to. The how-to. How do you do spiritual warfare? I've gone to church, and churches when they've done spiritual warfare, and all they do is shout at the devil for two hours. I mean, that ain't spiritual warfare. I was in a church once too, where they, they were singing very gustily, purify my heart, Lord. Make me like pure gold. And they were going on and on. It never stopped. Till finally I said, can I say something? They said, yeah. So you realize what you're saying tonight, didn't you? Make me like pure gold. You know what you're singing? Turn the heat up. Is that what you want? Turn the heat up, Lord, because I want to be gold. That's how you get refined gold. More heat. Anybody want some more heat? Are you got enough? We sing a lot of things that if it ever comes to pass, we're in trouble. <laughs> That's right. Young people go to college. I'll go to Africa, Lord. Send me to Africa. God lets you go back home, get a nice job, 2.4 children, nice home, nice car, good career, and he's in Africa. <laughs> That's what happens to you. See, God won't let you off of him that cost you nothing. He'll make sure when you do go to Africa, you go there because God has called you. And that is not a good idea. How many people know the church has suffered from good ideas. Books have been about good ideas. The problem is that good ideas don't work. We need to hear God. You see, the, the three basic channels of attack is temptation. Remember, temptation is not sin, but yielding to sin, and yielding to temptation is sin. That's the one channel, the temptation. There's the accuser. We say amongst ministers, Men ministers, the three G's will get most ministers. The girls, the gold, and the glory. Yeah. <laughs> or all three. The three G's will get you somewhere, or the one or two you get them. That's what I say to them anyway. It's amazing how we want to do it. He came shouting at God's people. Put pressure. That sense of accusing. That sense of deception. How do we handle it? In verse 17, verse 19 of 1 Samuel 17, Then Jesse said to his son David, Take now your brother an ephod of dried grain and the ten loaves and run your brothers at the camp and carry these ten cheeses to the captains and to the thousands and to see how your brothers fare and bring back good news. I believe one of the ways of handling, and the reason why I believe David could handle Goliath, one, because God will let you kill the lion and bear before you take on Goliath. Don't take on Goliath until you dealt with the lion and the bear. God will give you some practice. Anybody found that out? It's a fact. God gives you people to practice on. I've discovered that. That's right. He really does. But we see here one of the ways, I believe, that David could handle Goliath, now we handle the enemy, is that David had a servant heart. He was willing. Remember by this time, he was anointed king. He was the king in God's eyes. He had the anointing for it. But he's prepared to run cheeses and food to his brother at the battle line. Listen, let me tell you, if you want to beat the devil, the first step, I believe, is to have a servant heart. That you serve God, serve God's people. God is looking for people with a servant heart. Saul didn't have a servant heart. God is looking for people who will have a servant heart. Then in verse 20 and 22, I want to say a lot tonight, I want to move on quickly. 
So David rose up early in the morning, left the sheep with the keeper, and took the things and went as Jesse and commanded him. And he came to the camp where the army was going out to fight, shouting for the battle. For Israel and the Philistines are drawn up in a battle array, an army against army. And David left his supply in the hands of the supply and keeper and ran to the army and came to greet his brothers. Step number two. Don't take your steps, you know what I'm saying? David made himself accountable and responsible. <clears throat> he had to find some and look after his sheep. Listen, if God has given you the doorkeeper's job, don't go run off to Africa before you find somebody to give the books out the door. We have this grand ideas of ministry. We end up with so much power we don't know what to do with it. But if you want to defeat the enemy, I've discovered, be accountable and be responsible. He not only found somebody to look after his sheep, it says it, but when he came to battle, he just didn't, you know, said, oh, it's good to see my brothers with that, and he's off. And he left the sheep, he's left the donkeys with all the supplies. He found somebody to look after the donkeys. And I found the people that live straight, the people that enjoy God, the people that enjoy freedom, are people who are accountable and responsible. I found that. There's something about being accountable. Listen, every husband and every pastor, every leader needs a higher court of appeal than what you are. My wife has, has and she didn't tell her this, she knows if I don't listen to her, there's two other people she can ring. And Roger's one of them. And he, she's done that, so he knows that. Because my wife needs a higher court of appeal than me. That's right. Right. It's true. We need the higher court of appeal. Are you the last word in your life? Or are you accountable? Are you responsible? Because I believe many people who get defeated by the enemy, they're accountable to nobody. Other brothers come on the phone to me and say to me, you know, God's given me a word for your church. I say, yes, you better come and give it. But before you come, I want you to stay around for five years because if you don't come to pass, we'll stone you. <laughs> <laughs> you stone prophets where things don't come to pass. Everybody wants to give a word. Everybody wants to live on a word instead of reading the word. I mean, people have got so many words today, they can't move from them. They're confused. And the major reason is they're looking for somebody who can cope with them and tell them what they want to hear. Let me tell you, if you've come for help tonight, you need to ask yourself a question, how many people have I been to for help? Because if you keep on going to people for help, one day you're going to hear what you want to hear, then you are in trouble. You'll go to so many people, and one day God will let you hear. When, when Pharaoh rejected God, God hardened his heart. God hardened it. Wasn't the devil? God hardened it. Be accountable. Be responsible. Then verse 32. And David said to Saul, Let no man's heart fail because of him. Your servant will go and fight with his Philistine. Step number three, I believe this. If you're battling against the enemy, you've got to watch your mouth. Most Christians need a healing of the tongue. Because your tongue is your life. What comes out of your mouth is already in your heart. And if the heart is deceiving, the heart is the thing that does the damage. That's why Proverbs 4, 20 to 24 says, Watch your mouth and watch your heart, because what comes out of it is health to your flesh. That's why we know. We know that, that, um, that James chapter 3 said, It's your tongue that gets you the problem. It's not the storm that sinks a ship, it's which way the rudder is going. It's not the storm that sinks a ship. It's what your tongue is and what the rudder is. I believe if we want to meet the enemy, we need to know how to speak positively. We need to know how to be positive in what we're saying. I've been reminded in the last week or so, even by my own wife, the way that we talk about things, we end up being so negative. 
You know, it's, you know, you, you sort of hold a glass of water up to somebody, half a glass, you say, what is this? Some will say it's half full, some will say it's half empty. So you look at it. But people need to watch their mouth. Because when you're facing the enemy, your mouth can bring you down. Your mouth can destroy you. And there are folk here tonight, your tongue needs healing. It's wrecking your marriage. It's lost your jobs. It's made you fall out in churches you've been in because of your tongue. And you know something? It's poisoning your life. David knew. All their hearts are failing. He could have said, this guy, this guy is big. I'm sure they said to David, this, this guy is too big, you can't hit him. He said, he's too big, I can't miss him. It's right, isn't it? We need to speak positively. We really do. How do we fight and defeat the enemy like Goliath? In verse 34 and verse 37, But David said to Saul, Your servant used to keep his father's sheep. When a lion and bear came and took the lamb out of the flock, I went after him and struck it and delivered the lamb from his mouth. When it rose against me, I caught it by the beard, struck and killed it. Your servant has killed both the lion and the bear. And this uncircumcised Philistine will be like one of them, seeing he has defied the armies of the living God. We need to begin to recall what God has already done. There are folk who come to me saying, I wish God would do this and do that. When you look over your past, you see God providing for you right through your life. There have been times when I think I've done good. I had a good weekend. I remember driving down the motorway late one night. I've been three days in the northeast and God had done some tremendous things. Bodies all over the place. Demons screaming out in those days. Everybody throwing up all over the place. I tell you, it was quite something. And God was saving people and delivering. It was tremendous. And I drove down the motorway. God brought something in mind. He showed me a gypsy caravan not too far from here. Until the age of 10, when I got saved at 9, I never had a new pair of shoes on my feet. We never had shoes. He showed me, son, I brought you out of that. Never forget it. It's I made you great. I blessed you. It's what it's about. Think of where you've come from. I know for those who see and not see and I know my story. But I was smothered in Derman Tires and Eczema. I couldn't speak. My tongue was bound. A man called Gordon Lindsay who started came to this down the road here about three miles away. I couldn't wait. I couldn't go out and speak him because I couldn't face him. All my face, all my neck was peeling and bleeding inside my shirt. My shirt was sticking to me. Dermot tires next one on my body. I couldn't speak. Totally ashamed. It was near midnight when I went out for this man to pray for me. And it touches my spirit now. That's 40 odd years ago. But I turned in that man's face. I saw God's glory. He laid hands on me and I told him just loosed. And it fell off my body next day. You know, God says, that's what you was like. I did it, son. It wasn't your faith, it was my kindness. Because I loved you. We need to see the goodness and the kindness of God. We need to see his good to us. Sometimes we think our faith has done it. We need to look more to the goodness and kindness of God. He didn't do it because you had great faith. He did it because he loved you. And he cares about you. See him as your father. Not as somebody who tots you up and says, you've really done a lot of faith and done a lot of speaking. I'll answer your prayer. I'm glad it's my father. Stop, stop to recall what God has already done. When I think of my family, my mother was an epileptic person. Used to beat us unmercifully. Father was a Christian, never at home. Working, keeping seven of us in the family. We had nothing. But Jesus came. He came. That's why I was praying. The best thing ever happened to me was Jesus. Best thing that happened to my family, Jesus came to it. And Jesus did a work of grace. Stop and start to recall. He said, your servant, he went to lion and bear and just tore it and killed it. And who is this man? Listen, when you're up against your Goliath, that's taunting you and accusing you, you start to recall what God has already done. Start to bless God. Let God put some confidence there. And then in verse 38 and 39, Moreover, David said, The Lord who has delivered me from the poor of the lion will deliver me. So Saul clothed David with his armour and put 
a bronze helmet on his head, and he also clothed him with his coat of mail, and David fastened the sword to his armour and tried to walk. For he said he had not tested them. And David said to Saul, I can't walk with these, for I have not yet tested them. Let me tell you, brothers and sisters, if you want to beat Goliath, you've got to stop mouthing up what other people say. Saul did say to David, by this armour, by this sword, I brought many battles. What happened to Saul, David could not wear? Let me tell you, God has given you a faith. God has given you a belief. God has given you an understanding that fits you. Don't try to use other people. Don't buy the latest books on how to get faith and how to walk with God and mouth it off. You'll discover the devil will slaughter you before you get the end of it. You can't use what other people's used. You've got to find God for yourself. I remember being in Moreland's College about four or five years ago speaking there. One young man came up to me and I've said it to a number of people. I don't know what I'm talking about. The other night, you know, I want to go on. I want to be a man of God. What should I do? I said, you married? He said, no. I said, get married, have a couple of kids. Got to sort you out. That's all right. That's true. We're looking for these great feats in God. Let me tell you. If you can have three children, bring them up in the ways of God and present them before God, you've done a good job. You've done what he told you to. Don't depend on other people's experience. That's what Saul tried to do. He tried to put his armour on David. But you can't use what's been blessing, what's brought victory for other people, either by books, tapes, whatever it is. I knew a brother years ago who was a farmer. And a man come to him, fell off a tractor, and his back was broken. They brought him to him in a wheelchair, and wasn't saved very long. And he took him into his barn, because of the noise and the smell, he said. And he began to pray for him, and God healed his back. See, no the only problem is, brother, for years after anybody sick, I'd take him to the barn to pray for him. We think the barn's a place. So what happens? My friend Joe Coates was riding a bike. A world pump got filled with the Holy Ghost. It's amazing when he gave that testimony for the first time, how many Christians bought a bike and went to the world park to get the Holy Ghost. <laughs> it's weird. Because we think that's it. You can't depend upon other people's experience. Listen, have a week off from work, shut your door, don't speak to anybody, get on your knees and sort it out with God. Either you're break in, break up or break through. You do something. That's right. Don't use other people's experience. No matter how many people buy books and how to get healed. Seven easy steps for victory. Anybody found it's not easy? <laughs> Even the title's wrong. That's right. How to get, you know, signs of one's miracle. First we get saved, then we get baptized in water, fill the Holy Spirit, use the gifts, be a pastor, etc., etc. How many people know there's not one, two, three, four, five with God? God's got no order. Father Rick Thomas, a dear Catholic brother filled with the Spirit, come know Jesus, come into this country. And he went out, got a thing called the Lord's Farm. Out there, there's been a film or a video being made on Viva Christa Ray. And he had this big harvest and God said, give it all away. But that man's learned to hear God and obey God, so he gave all the harvest away. Is how you going to feed all this? He says, not my problem. God told me to give it away. And every day, God brought produce to him every day. Seed the sick healed. He was telling a friend of mine, he said, my only problem is, brother, over the years of ministry, I've only seen th see three people raised from the dead. You can't understand what was happening. That's what it's about. Don't depend on other people's experience. Then verse 40, in the same chapter, then he took his staff and his hand, he chose for himself five small stones from the brook and put them in a shepherd's bag, what he used every day. Did you know that? He's used to putting stones in bag. That's what Paul was saying here. Some were saying this morning. And a sling in his hand and drew near to the first time. We need to make decisions. But have you ever thought about it? He, why did he, why did he choose five stones when the first one did the job? You know what I think? It is dangerous to be so sure you know what God's going to do. You don't know what's going to do. 
Some people said he had four brothers, which he did have, all giants. But I believe this, he wasn't that short. Listen, when people are that short, it frightens me. I know what God's going to do. <laughs> you better know. Because I've heard it said before. I had a brother say to me, he's going to go to somewhere and go and preach the gospel in front. It's going to happen, that's going to happen. I said, you better be sure, brother. If I was you, I'd take a return ticket. Don't do it that way, he said. He had to work in vineyards for three months, get, get enough fare to get home. When he came to this country, he was like skin and bone. He soon found out you need more than faith than that. Need some sanctified common sense to go with it. That's right. We end up with a faith that if that ever goes down, and I mean, I mean let's be honest here. How many people know that faith isn't what you've heard? You know what I mean? I've heard all the messages on faith. It's a fact. I was with a church, and our brother in knows it, but it won't bury a friend of ours for three days. They confess faith. Now, I don't know how to read the end of uh, Hebrews 11. You can die by faith. Did you know that? How many people know here that have your head taken off, you need faith? How many people here know that by faith to go about naked, destitute and afflicted, nobody wants you, you need faith for it? That's the kind of faith. Everybody wants faith to get them out of the hole. Did you know that? How many people know God wants to keep you in it? It's a fact. We end up with this kind of faith that the moment, you know, God is my butler. Not my butler. I just sent your gifts to me. He's a spiritual father Christmas. What do you want today, my son? Just ask for it. When Susan was a little girl, we used to have a thing called viral. Anybody remember viral dummies? When they cried in the viral, straight in the dummy. Many times in the night, Susan, when she got up in the morning, had this viral all around her face. But <laughs> Tried to find a mouth. <laughs> Everybody thinks God's like that. You know, the moment you cry, put something in your mouth. And you suck on it. Feel good. How many people know that sometimes God doesn't turn up? That's why let Lazarus die, I believe. Just asked him, Hindu no lovest this sick, very emotional. God didn't respond. How many people you let somebody die and still have it right? This ain't very popular talking, I'm sure you're that. <laughs> but he made a decision. He chose five stones. But I, ch I believe he chose five stones because in his mind there was strategy. He planned it. It wasn't on the five stones. He had strategy. He didn't pick up stones or scripts, he said five. We're saying to our evangelism team, you need more than anointing. I say this to people, if you're going to make it through this life, you're going to need more than the anointing to get you through it. Anybody found that out? How many people you know you don't always feel anointed? How many people feel you wish the other person was anointed so that it would go away? <laughs> then verse 41 to 44, it talks about, so the Philistines came and began drawing dear to David. And David brought a shield and went before him. When the Philistine looked about, he saw David. He was totally disdained. He was just a youth. Some say about 15 years old, I believe. Not very old. Who am I, he says. You see, David did not make a decision out of fear. When you're in fear, don't make decisions. I know a man once heard a man was about to go on an aeroplane next day and somebody said, Brother, I wouldn't go on an aeroplane if I was you tomorrow. I've got a, a really sense of, of, of something inside me that says, Don't go on it, it's going to crash. The man never went. The only problem is, for the next 10 years, he never went on an aeroplane. Never make a decision out of fear. That's what happened to Elijah. When Jezebel said to him, I'm going to have your life like you did my prophets, in fear, he ran. When you're full of fear, stay. Stand. We forget that in Ephesians 6. Having done all to stand. David kept up his confessing when you read that. In verse 45, 47. 
He kept confessing, even when he's running towards Goliath, he's keeping his mouth going, he's saying, this is what God will do. This is what God's going to do. If you read the instant, he ran to Goliath. Listen, don't let the devil come after you, go for him in the morning. I always say every morning, look Satan, we might as well get things straight. This is true. I know today you're not going to leave me alone. So let's start a war now. I'm coming for you. That's a fact. The best form of defence is attack. It's a fact. It is. The best form of defence is attack. Because he ain't going to leave you alone. So he might as well have a war to begin with. Just go for it. Start telling who Jesus is. Start telling the cross was a finished work. You see... I feel sometimes we don't fully understand God. Jesus, 33 years old, he rose from the grave. I would have thought he should have begun his ministry. Anybody agree with that? Only 33, the Son of God, healed the sick, rose out of the grave. Over 500 people see him. He was ready to start a ministry, but God took him home. I never understand that. The greatest misunderstanding we have that I hear speakers talk about outside of church, is that Jesus Christ, the Son of the living God, who created man, and the biggest defeat, a misunderstanding, is that Jesus, the Creator, was being crucified by the creatures He created. That was God's finest victory. When we think God's got it wrong, He's just got it right. We really don't understand, because we look through this, what's in it for me? God wouldn't do it to me. Yes, he would. Because he loves you. My old father used to have a saying in the early years. As children, say, son, if you do what I tell you, I'll down the woodshed. The woodshed was God puts a stick on that end, same in the trunch and on that end. That's the way he believed it. That's what he used to say. He said, if you give children that end a wallop, you won't get a trunch on that end. And it worked for us anyway. We never got the trunch. But I believe he had that confidence. He ran towards Goliath. He took the battle to the enemy. Do it with confidence in God. Knowing God will take care of you. We find too that he not only stunned him, but he killed him. Let me just say this. Many Christians only stunned Goliath. They never actually put him to death. He said, David had no sword in his hand. He had to go and take Goliath's sword and cut his head off. He had no sword. And David, with the stone only, stunned him. He didn't kill him. And when you stun the enemy, you better finish him off. Completely. Don't let him get up. Make sure you not only stun him, but you kill him. In verse 50 and 51. It said in verse 52 and 53, he chased it, all the enemies. When you dealt with Goliath, you better deal with everything that goes with him. You'll find the enemy works in clusters. You'll find that, that when David wanted that man's wife, he covered her. That was sin number one. Then he took her and committed adultery, number two. Then he got her husband home to sleep with her so he'd cover up his sin, but he wouldn't do it, number three, deception. Number four, he had him killed. You'll find the enemy doesn't work on one, he keeps working until you're in a mess and you can't get out. And David couldn't get out until the prophet came to him and said, you're the man. Have you ever thought about that? <clears throat> David said, the man who has done this, when Nathan told him the story in the parable about the poor man's lamb, how the rich man took it, he said, the man who has done this, we put to death. And Nathan said, you're the man. How do you think of other people's sins? When you read the newspapers, how can they do that? How do you think about your own issues, your own sin issues? How do you deal with them? Let me just say it in closing, verse 54, that I think is important. And David took the head of the Philistine and brought it to Jerusalem and put his arm in his own tent. When you defeat the enemy, you can keep his army, armour, but his head, which is the glory, belongs to God. He took it back to Jerusalem. Listen, when you've wrought your victory, make sure God gets the glory. It belongs to him. There's nothing you can take for yourself. When David finally cut his head off, 
He put the armour in his own tent to remind him of the victory. But he took Goliath's head, put it back in Jerusalem, and gave God the glory. Whatever God does in your life, remember, he holds the glory. It belongs to him. And I've seen it over these years, 30 years, the men who have touched the glory, you will discover they don't get through right. Let us conclude by saying this and we finish here. How can I really be free? I believe if the enemy's been after you, you need to have that sense of recognition, to know your weak areas, do the things we've heard tonight. A sense of recognition, because we choose the way out or not. God doesn't choose it, we have to choose it. We have to choose the way out. It's half down to us. There needs to be a sense of repentance. Repentance means change your mind. You do that. Not what God does, what you do. Repentance is what we do. We have to change our thinking. You have to change it. The prodigal son set down and his repentance was this. What my father's got is better than what I've got. I'm going to get up and go home to father. He changed his mind. Because if he hadn't changed his mind repentant, he wouldn't have gone back. And have you noticed when the father see him? He didn't say, you better go have a bath, put some clothes on, and I'll talk to you. So when he saw him a great way off, he ran, fell on his neck and kissed him. I understand the same word there is what is found in Acts 2, when the Holy Spirit fell on them. And Dad, it's the same word, I understand. He fell on his neck and kissed him. He'd been in the pigsty. I found in my life that God doesn't do a cleaning up job before he shows me he loves me. He has a way of loving me. He doesn't know clean you up and I'll talk to you. I'll clean you up and I'll bless you. Now he blesses me anyway. Because he sees there's a repentance. There needs to be that deliverance. You see, if the enemy has defeated you, you know you've missed it, you know you haven't made it, I believe God wants you to turn around because God wants to take those defeats, those things that have been a stumbling block, He wants to turn them into stepping stones. I've discovered in my life when I fell, when I've done things and thought things, God has used them to make sure I don't go down the same road again. That's what Paul said to Timothy, what you see in me, you do. I believe the church is full of people who say, do what I say, but don't do what I do, otherwise you get in the trouble that I get into. Well, I see, and I've seen it all across this country. But God is looking for men and women who will face Goliath, who will face him without fear, who will have an utter dependence on the God of Israel as David did. And just as a side, everybody thinks God took that stone and put it in his head. No, I'm going to tell you something. David did it, put it there through sheer skill. Read it. He could throw a stone at hundred paces at a hair's breadth. He practiced it well. Oh yeah, just turn up, God will do it. That's not what the Bible says. David practiced throwing stones. But when the Holy Spirit took hold of the stone, old Goliath discovered he was a stone heavier in a few seconds. Somebody said, that thing had never entered his head before, and I don't think it was either. <laughs> Let's pray. I believe tonight there are folk here who have come, and you know you're defeated. God's word for you tonight from scripture is get up and stand. You say, I can't. No, you're not telling the truth. What you're really saying, I won't. <coughs> when people say, I can't forgive, I say, no, you won't. Because you can get up if you choose it. Because if you choose it, God will give you the strength to get up. And we want to pray for those who are hurting, those who are sick, those who feel they're bound and oppressed, 
want to pray for those who are sick too, for healing. But I believe first there are those here who need to make a choice tonight that they're going to stand. They're going to make a choice that they're going to have God heal their tongue and heal their mouth. Because it's got you into trouble, you've caused division in your family, your marriage, your home. And God is saying, I want to heal your mouth. It was said about, said about Alexander the Great, who conquered the known world, but he killed his best friend in a fit of temper <coughs> and never got over it. His best friend, lifelong friend, he killed him in a fit of temper. He could conquer the world, but he couldn't conquer his temper. Before you take on your Goliath, make sure you've got to hold, and got hold on the issues you deal with the enemy within. You stand. Let the devil know you've got, they've got the, he's got no ground in your life. Place it under the blood of Christ. Bring it to the cross tonight. I believe that those here who don't know the Lord Jesus, you've never really met him. You've never really, as Danny was sharing tonight, as he sang, he's Lord. Because he is Lord. That's where Peter got it wrong, by saying, not so, Lord. You can't say that. It's a contradicting term. Not so, Lord. But God wants you to stand up on the inside before you stand up on the outside. God wants to deal with those who have been defeated. Those who feel dispirited here tonight. Those who feel they've blown it, missed it. And you're sitting down. And God is saying, get up. Those who have never come to know Jesus, you're here tonight, you don't know him. And you want to. Because you feel defeated. You feel life is passing you by. I believe there's one man here tonight who's very gifted indeed. But the enemy defeats you every day through your mind. Because that's where the defeat comes. To win the battle of the mind, you win the battle of life. And God wants you to take hold of that. And those here who know you're not accountable to anybody. You don't have a servant's heart. You want to be served, but you can't serve. Those here who know that their mouth needs healing. You know that your tongue has poisoned your life, poisoned your marriage, poisoned relationships. And I believe tonight God wants to heal it so you can stand. And having done all to stand, and when the evil day comes, you can withstand and still stand up. But your mouth will defeat you, unless it's under the control of the Holy Spirit. I'm so glad that God used the Tower of Babel to confuse tongues, but on the day of Pentecost, he used tongues to bring 3,000 into the kingdom, when the Holy Spirit had control of it. And God wants to bring a number of people with their tongue under the Holy Spirit tonight. And it needs healing. The root needs healing. There's a root of bitterness there. You have been hurt. But somehow every time you talk, there's a bitterness there. God wants healing. If that's you tonight, we want to pray for you first. One prayer. If that's you tonight, here's a number out here. I'd like to pray for you. Asking God to really set you free. To bring healing to your tongue and to your mouth. That God will cleanse your mouth and cleanse your tongue. Because your tongue is a tree to your life. And the healing of the tongue is a healing of your life. Many people have problems because of their mouth. They really do. God wants to set you free. And God wants you to know healing. And God wants to bring down those Goliaths. But you have to choose it. David chose it. Saul didn't. David did. And if that's you tonight, I want you to stand to your feet and I'm going to pray for you. For those of you who know that, just stand to your feet now. You know you need it. That's right. Gotta pray.
God is looking for a people who will obey him. People will be as soldiers as 2 Timothy 2. I was going to read that night. We need to be like soldiers. We don't entangle ourselves with civilian life. Because we're soldiers in an army. There's a war on. And God is not looking for compromises. I said this morning to Caleb, he said he went and saw and he gave what he had from his heart as a conviction. Caleb was a man who lived by conviction, not by convenience. And there were people who were living by convenience, not by conviction. That's why you get defeated. Start living by conviction. Start living by what God's put in your heart, not by convenience. And I'm going to pray now. As I pray, I want you to reach out in faith in your heart that God will do that. And then we want to have those four words just to pray before we do that. Father, you know why we're standing. We stand before you, Lord. Not because we're wicked sinners, but because we know there's issues we want to put right. I pray for those who are standing who have never made a, a commitment to Christ. I pray tonight, Lord Jesus, they might find you whom to know is life eternal. I pray tonight, Lord, for those who have been defeated by their tongue and by their mouth. For those who have been defeated in many ways. For those, Lord, who their Goliath taunts them every day. Some will go to bed tonight. And in the quiet of their heart, the enemy will taunt them. There's fear of death. Fear of failure. Fear of not making it. Fear of rejection. And the enemy is taunting them. Father, in Jesus' name, we come against the voice of the accuser. And we command you to shut up and be silent in the minds of these people. You have to obey because Jesus is Lord. He's King. You have to obey because we place you under the Lordship of Jesus. We bind up the works of darkness. We bind up history here tonight. We're people about a history. We pray, Lord, you not only wipe the slate clean, but you'll destroy the slate. We pray for those who need healing in their mouth, in their tongue, that have caused division in their family, in their marriage, in their church, in their home, at work. Father, we ask you now, you'll come, Holy Spirit, and bring healing to the tongue and to the mouth. Bring your healing power now. Do it right now, Lord, we pray. And bring healing. <coughs> bring healing to the hearts here tonight. Some have an evil heart. Some have a hardened heart. Some, Lord, have a heart that wants his own way. I ask you now, Holy Spirit, come and bring healing, bring wholeness, take away the stubbornness, deal with the idolatry, and we ask you, Lord Jesus, to make yourself plain and clear in the lives of these people so they can live, and when Goliath in their life comes at them, they can take him on and do like David did and destroy him. That is your desire. You said those who are born of God have been born to overcome. Everyone that's born of God is born to overcome. For this is the victory that overcomes the world, even our faith. It overcomes. So Father, bless. Have your hand upon it for good. May everybody standing here tonight know that there's no condemnation. There's no condemnation. We thank you. Help us to see, Lord, the conviction is a shepherd that leads and condemnation is a slaughterman the slaughter that said there's no way out that's the enemy you've seen there's no way out but conviction says you've done wrong you confess it it's cleansed it's healed and you're restored because you're a shepherd you don't drive you lead and so father come now holy spirit bring healing Bring wholeness to the Spirit. May they know just how much you love them and care for them. May your name be glorified and the kingdom be extended now, Father. And we'll give you all the praise and all the glory. Because you're worthy and because you're God of who you are. We give you thanks. Bring healing to the mind, to the Spirit. Heal the broken heart that's been prayed already tonight. We pray for that balm of Gilead that will come. <coughs> And soothe and bring healing, wholeness, give strength, give grace, give courage. 
So, Father, we ask you tonight to come and do what only you can do. In all our failures, we've missed it, we've blown it. But you're God of restoration. You're God of restores. So we ask you now, Holy Spirit, to come and to do a mighty work. We ask this for Jesus' sake. Amen.